and we're live hello everyone welcome to everyone wherever you are welcome to Whangarei New Zealand we're here it's evening it's seven o'clock usually we do our evening shows around this time because well we've had dinner and we've watched a bit of news and we settled down a bit more but more relaxed the day is over and um, got a few more things we've thought through the day and worked out you know, uh, the reason we our topic today is my are. guest again is uh, Jared um, Jared Taylor, our local reverend, <laughs> um, our uh, finance advisor, uh, risk management, money stuff, and we're going to talk about a lot about money stuff. And whenever we talk about money stuff, people kind of get put off by it and um, kind of don't want to think about it. And I think it's a good time to really think about money stuff. And uh, because of all that's going on, the reason we're talking about today with these topics here, New Zealand, uh, whatever happened to supporting New Zealand as, as a topic, um, you know, when we came, we went into lockdown, um, my whole idea was uh, when we come out of lockdown, how are we going to see the world? And my thing was we need to support New Zealand. We need to buy New Zealand products, uh, help our small businesses, help our big businesses and um, think about how to get the economy going up again by supporting local made products and local made ingenuity. Now, I didn't understand, I didn't know this, but um, in February this year, $20 million worth of jobs from New Zealand went to India, right? To a company in India for IT. Now that's $20 million of income right that could have gone into our it industry and i've talked about it and and also jared's talked about it as well uh about what's um you know uh over the last few weeks we talked about how in the 2008 around that period where we saw about ten thousand it um kiwis um job um you know the industry people leave they left and nobody said hey you know what we need you here give you a bit more money stay here but they said no no it's all right we don't need you we'll, we'll raise up the next people so that's 10 years ago or so and here we are now at the start of the year i didn't even know this and so it's new to me i saw this come across my face um, um actually no i found it through what the other topic that i'm talking i'm going to talk about which is from um uh the new zealand rail the two three i think it's 387 something like million dollars of jobs uh, going over to South Africa of all places and off China of all places, right? We're saying we don't we don't want to sell off our New Zealand economy to somewhere, yet we're selling off our companies and not only just that, the jobs. When you look at a 387 million or so, whatever that is, that's income that can go into ingenuity, into the households of New Zealanders, of Kiwis who need those jobs. And now we're gonna see those jobs go away. Now, what kind of government says, you know, we're gonna spend $300 million in the arts and then turns around and says, well, we're gonna give these contracts to overseas where it comes to hardworking taxpayers. So that's also, you know, $300 million, the tax money. Well, somebody else is paying that tax into their own com own country when they earn that, right? When that comes into their pocket, oh, oh well, I've got the wage now. I've got to give a pay, you know, pay the tax into my own country. So that country's well off because of it, and we're left out. Um, one of the other topics that um, I want to bring up is the fraud that um, some, um, you know, my mum mentioned last week on Monday uh, on a thirtieth anniversary of being a New Zealand citizen, a uh, fortieth, sorry, anniversary of being a New Zealand citizen that how come all these companies are firing people when they're actually getting handouts from the government to keep people there uh you know keep people employed how come they some of them seem to be in another thing that some um, a married lady said to me today uh on the street is like you know why is everybody worried about what's going on overseas and we're watching our people become unemployed here and i was like well this is what happens somebody's trying to always make a make a buck out of somebody else's misery and you know it's always there it's just human nature but the other thing is um she mentioned was um about jobs same thing my mom mentioned so how come uh, you know we're having unemployment in so many large numbers when the government is putting out money into these employers you know and how come some employers are actually uh trying to get uh, subsidies for people that don't even work for them 
you know, that don't even, they're not employed. And that's this financial thing that we're going through. And it's quite hard, I think, in a, in a way to um, try to break it all up. But it's not something new, is it, um, Jay? Have you seen this, you know, well, you've lived overseas. Have you seen that happening there as well in this sort of thing? Well, I seem to recall on um, one of the other chats that we did live talking about the stimulus package, I mentioned then my concerns and fears around the fact that as the government goes into debt because of the pandemic, as, as pretty much every government is doing, yeah, is that the fear is is that that money that we're going into debt for, which is bad enough, mm. is mm. that then um, we're then spending that money overseas. Yeah, and I said it then, and I'll say it now, is that, uh, and and it's and it's not just direct contracts; it's also mm. the sorts of businesses that are getting stimulus. And it appears that, um, you know, we need to have more understanding and more discussion around where this money is going and whose hands is it flowing into and, and, and where does it end up? Because if this is all about supporting New Zealand, then um, I think more than the scrutiny around you know, who's getting what, I, I think we should be having more scrutiny around how much of that money is leaking leaking overseas, you know. Um, uh, you don't want, you know, this great, very once-in-a-lifetime generous um, economic stimulus to end up being like a leaky boat that ends up uh, creating, you know, more... Um, uh, wealth disparity and also is that you know we don't want the country going into debt with the profits of that then going overseas like what is the point of that like if if this stimulus package is to stimulate the New Zealand economy then it really should be focused on the New Zealand economy and it clearly isn't it, it, does, it doesn't seem like it is I mean if you you know if one um with the uh, NZ Rail turning around and sending up, you know, jobs. This is jobs we're talking about. And I feel like um, uh, all of a sudden I feel like John, uh, what's his name on on the on the on the news? This is this is New Zealand jobs. You know, and it's like it, it's like money equals New Zealand jobs. When these guys say, "Well, we're going to send a, a contract overseas," well, it's a large amount of New Zealand money that that they could just have workers work on those projects not only that that it's like um, I'm not, I don't understand much 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 about business and money when it comes to terminology but about fiscal you know the idea is it fiscal where you know you can stimulate other um, other um, other other businesses that come for, from this. So I mentioned that because one of the um, one of the gentlemen, elderly gentleman today, told me about that the fact that all these tiles, right, that's been um, for this um, uh, that museum that's being made, right, a Honda Vasa, it's coming from Italy. All those tiles. Do we have in New Zealand a tile company that can produce that? The first thing I thought was, what about Waipu? Waipu tiles could have built a huge kiln. You know, import. You know, built built their own kiln, set up a whole lot of employees, right, to make all those tiles here. Whatever millions of dollars it cost for those tiles to be, they could have made it here. What was the what was the reasoning behind that? Um, that we to import these tiles. Far as I know, Honda Vasa was all about New Zealand and Northland, right? I'm sure if he was alive, he would go, well, why are we importing these tiles from Italy to do something that represents New Favore? Northland, and this sort of thing that this is what people are thinking about these things you know i um, i usually don't come up with ideas and topics normally right i see what's coming and i go well this is what we're going to talk about today this is, this is what is in people's heads and when somebody chucks this out i'm going okay well let's talk about what people are thinking i you know i'm very my whole thing's about art and my whole thing's about comic books and pop culture but 
lately, you know, this whole thing about, um, I've been always been interested in politics. And when people start talking about, well, why are we importing tiles from Italy for Handavaza Museum here that our own city, has to, you know, taxpayers have to pay for, yet we can't say to Waipu Tiles, hey, you know what? Are you interested in getting all this money could you be able to do this work? Could you employ locals to come and work with you? Because those Waipu tiles have been around for decades. You know, if they're still around, I'm not sure. But that would stimulate the whole town of Waipu. Think of all the tilers, tile makers and, you know, tile artists, you know, that are in New Zealand. They would go, you know what? I think we could go and live in Waipu for a little while, you know, get a, get a little um, rent a house there. And buy the food there, uh, use you know use the power they use the internet, and, and to stimulate that economy there by doing that. And I think we lose a lot by just sending away contracts overseas. Was there a reason behind this? I mean, I was always against this, but this is makes me fume, and I'm sure a lot of more people will fume when they realize that millions of dollars went across overseas just to bring tiles from. And the other thing is, we are very green, right? What about those carbon, you know, carbon footprints they talk about all the time, right? Carbon footprint from Waipu to here isn't that far. So we, you know, this is what comes in my head. I always laugh when they go about carbon, carbon footprint. And I don't understand um, the logic sometimes with these guys when they make these decisions, you know. Why, why can't you just go, well, not only that, quarry, right? The quarry does glazing and tile and there's artists here. I mean, I do ceramic, so I understand that. But they could have got a whole lot of local, if not Waipu, here to do that. Stimulate the quarry. Put millions of dollars into the quarry and you have a whole bunch of studio artists that will be there coming up. We'll have camper vans building new buildings there for them to stay in, which would be still there later when this is all over for other artists to come and have residence. And that will continue. And th that's, a, you know, I just kind of think that these people don't think about these things when it comes to, because they're rushing with the dollars and things like, right, million dollars, well, Italian tiles, we'll show them we have tiles from Italy. What do you think about that? Look, I don't know about that particular example as to the background around, um, you know, why some particular tiles from Italy are the right thing. Um, but, but but you do raise a really good point, and this is kind of the discussion, right? So I want to clarify one thing I said before because I think it relates to, to, the, to what you've just said. So, you know, the reality is is that um, uh, and, and, and this was um, very much the case, you know, is that New Zealand... Um, doesn't have all of the capabilities and means by which to make everything that we want to consume. So we, we we import stuff. I think what we need to do is to have a really good conversation around, you know, nationally, around, um, you know, we, we've been on the march of globalisation for a, for a very long time. And there are absolutely, um, you know, benefits um, to that. Um, you know, imagine, imagine if, um, you know, uh, our our people in the Pacific Islands had to make everything. You know, they've got even a smaller amount of resources. Is it fair that because you know they don't have the factories and the technology and the raw minerals and resources that they're not allowed to have a laptop? Yeah. So, so, so this is one of these kind of things which we've kind of talked about before. Is that on on one level, you know, we sort of say like, you know, well, we we should do as 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 much as we can from our own country with our own people with our own technology with our own resources. And then at the other end of the scale, it's like, well, can we make a laptop? Mm. Like, do we actually have all of the resources in this country that go into what makes a laptop? Mm. Um, and at some point, there's a there's a there's a, a uh, an area where we need to kind of go. Well, maybe we should import less 
that's okay. But then what do you draw the line at around what you import and, and what you don't? And also part of the problem is, is complicated by the fact that, so, so let's take the New Zealand rail stuff as an example. You know, so, some, of, some, of, some of this stuff will be to spend money um, on, on buying one-off things that um, we don't have the expertise here, we don't have the infrastructure here to make it and so forth. So uh, that's fine. But, you know, this is where if we were smart, what we would do is to say, so of that money that's going overseas or could potentially go overseas, what's the sort of stuff that we strategically think that we should actually um, invest in here? Um, and, and what's the stuff that, you know, we don't want to invest in? Like, this was the whole debacle around um, around uh, PPE, around um, uh, medical protection equipment, is that um, most of it is imported. Why yeah. is it imported? It was imported because... Um, you know, our our hospital system um, found that um, it's cheaper to import the stuff from the suppliers in India and China and other mm. countries. Now, why is that? Well, it's because those people get paid less. Yeah. Like, you know, whenever you try and buy something of a that that's kind of commoditized, that's that's made in China or India or somewhere else. It's it's why is it cheaper? It's it's cheaper for a few good reasons. One, it's cheaper because they get paid um, a very very small wage, um, and uh, so so that's one bit. It's low wages, so we're taking advantage. We're we're, we're basically saying um, we don't want our people in New Zealand to have to live on a dollar an hour. Yeah. Right. Are we okay with them? But we're okay with somebody else somewhere else yeah. that we don't know, that we don't have to, you know, walk mm. past in the street. We're okay for them to work for a dollar an hour. So that's one problem. The second problem is, is that also we don't want to have to live in the filth and the pollution that's been created by the factories that produce these goods. So we're happy. We're happy to push the pollution problem from that manufacturing to somewhere else. Um, and, and so, you know, this is kind of what's been happening is that we've been pushing the problems of manufacturing, we've been driving prices down, we've been ignoring the ecological impacts because we don't want it in our town, you know. And that, yeah, and, and that, that reminds me of Bhopal. Do hmm? you remember Bhopal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just straight away, that remind me of Bhopal in India. You know, just the top six. another one. Yeah. And bec um, they, uh, what was it? Like it was a fertilizing plant that just, you know, whatever happened to it, it just um, um, destroyed people's lives, destroyed the, um, the whole area. And it's still, I think if I remember right, it's still affecting people now. And, yeah, yeah you're right, you know. Um, the idea that uh, we don't want to see that sort of stuff happening here, so we're okay with sending it overseas. But um, I'll just give you a quick um, death count. Um, here we go. So, do, do you want the the summary? The summary. Yeah, let me just um, put this up here so people know what this is about. So, but, now it's a Bhopal. What was it? It was a um, fertilizing plant. Uh, it was a gas leak. Right. From a uh, pesticide plant. Now, this um, this is the weird thing. Uh, like, I, I got something which will um, play soon because I want to bring that into it as well. It's something that I haven't really thought about, which is about vaccines. You know, that was just something interesting since we're talking about this, right? Um, I'll bring that up later. Go for it. Tell us about this Bhopal situation. And I remember this from like about 1990, I think it was, when I heard about it. Is it about the right yeah. time? Am I right there? Uh, it was 1984. Yeah, yeah. So remembering in, um, hearing about it in 1990 was about right. Yeah. So um, uh, the non-fatal injuries. Mm. 
560,000 people. Deaths. That is, the deaths. What is that? Is that like an eighth of New Zealand? Uh, it's like 10%. That's that's ten percent of New Zealand with non-fatal injuries from a leak of a pesticide plant. Yeah, in India. Yeah, and then uh, deaths. Uh, the official figure is uh, three thousand seven hundred and eighty-seven, uh, but there's claims that actually that was really sixteen thousand. It's so, you and know, this is from a Western company, isn't it? It was an American. Is what is it, an American company? Uh, yeah, Union Carbide. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. um, like, and this is know, still affecting the ba um um you know the children that are being born to these families of Indians, and so they set up this um, Union Carbide set up this uh, pesticide uh, uh, factory over in India and. They never, they've been trying, if I remember right, have they sorted that out yet? Have they did the payments? Have they addressed it? I'm not too sure, actually. But um, what uh, was interesting is that um, th there was another one recently. Oh. Which people overlooked because of um, um, every, everyone's been There's so busy. Yeah. Uh, so um, there was a uh, polymer um, factory, um, which um, uh, there was actually was yeah, that in here's, an stat. Here's, here's an interesting stat: um, mm. uh, fifty-four thousand people in India were killed or injured in factory accidents between twenty fourteen and twenty sixteen. Right. And some people believe the figure is actually like about 15 times um, higher. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, like, so j there was just an accident last year where there were 43 people died, 60 killed in Delhi. Um, so, you know, this sort of stuff is um, is happening all the time. And, and the other interesting thing is that, um, you know, the air pollution from, you know, all of this manufacturing is yeah. like killing hundreds and thousands, millions of people um, around the world. So, uh, you yeah. know, we, we've got some real soul searching to do because it, it's very easy to import something. You know, you get this nice shiny thing and this nice plastic wrapping, you know, without yeah. realizing like um, I, I actually thought about an art project a little while ago and and I was going to do it and, and, and maybe... I might still reconsider it. It was just, it, I just felt that it was going to be so controversial that I wasn't too sure, you know, whether people were kind of really ready for it. And and what the art project was about was um, uh, basically you could go into a website and you enter in some basic information about the way that you live your life Mm. And it will tell you how many people you are killing per hour. Mm. Here's the thing. All right. Also, oh, and but on the good news was is is that it, you could then through the website you could adjust your life cycle and then you could work out how many less people you were killing. But but the interesting thing was was that um because we did some mathematical modeling around and, and and there's a there's a there's an interesting point whereby like you can only slim your life down so much yeah and you will and you are you are still murdering someone or a yeah. part of a person you know every day because unless um you you um but, but then there's flip sides to this because because then if you sort of opt out to live a life whereby like there's no chance at all that you could cause any harm then yeah. it kind of like flips back on itself because then well then if you are out of the system and you're not paying tax yes. that means that somebody else is actually going it's to die the burden for you because because you're not carrying a, a social cost and burden
That's a, I mean, like, I mean, for people who don't know me, right, this is not something like, uh, like social activism or social justice isn't new to me. I didn't discover it last year. I've been um, with this for at least about, for myself, not this tokenism kind of thing it's become now, but I've been about this since like the 90s when I went, you know, like when I heard about these things, I would do paintings like, uh, you know, uh, I've got a painting up on the wall and it's got, it's basically, I think I did it in about 2000 because I talked to an, a, um, I was thinking about this topic and I had this um, Asian lady, I don't know, if she, I think she was Mandarin and I heard, you know, I've seen these child soldiers and this is like from 90s. I'll, actually, I'll grab it just to show. Um, excuse me. Oh. Okay, so this is one of the pieces that I did. Okay, let me just grab the rail thing off here. Um, and we're still talking about this sort of stuff. So this is basically, it says, a child tonight with a cigarette, tomorrow a soldier with a gun, right? So this is something from 2000, like 20 years ago. I did as an art piece. And another one was um, was taken from, a, you know, from the Bible, which said, uh, speak for those who can't speak for themselves seek justice for them. And there's a painting I did 20 years ago that's, that was given as a gift, uh, which was part of that one there. And it's and I think people, a lot of people sometimes kind of see this and go, we don't, you know, because it's the latest thing that's happening. Hey, let me help. Let me put that up there. There we go. Hello. Yeah. I'm at, I was actually think, hoping that you'd come on sometime with us. And I think tonight's a good time. If you're available, Please come and join us. Uh, I will, um, um, Jared, can you send her the invite? We'll put her on later because I want to talk about what she's doing. I've really been wanting to talk about it and I think it's best for the three of us to be on at the same time and talk about that. Because I think um, that's the other side of that coin that you're talking about, right? Um, being part of the system and doing something with it. Um, but here's the thing. We, like, in the 90s and in 2000s, Nike was making shoes and their clothing over in, in, in Indonesia. That was the same time I was making my own brand of um, clothing. Uh, I had my own brand called Forgiven on it uh, and it was, you know, I've still got a couple of things there. I had my own logo and everything and I and I read the book No Logo and I read it and I thought this is not how I think we should be living and I did everything I could think of that was as positive as I could in my life and try to be as, um, you know, to do what I could. And I think the idea that this, this whole thing about, we talk about wealth disparity and I really want you to go into it again, because I think a lot of people and I myself don't understand it that much, but here's something I, I'm, when I was talking, I did a thing live cast on um, Saturday night and it was the first time I mentioned social welfare as a caste system. I'd never even thought of it. I was live streaming and it popped in my head. I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go with this. It is a caste system. It's a generational thing. If people don't realize that this is, um, this is basically a way to keep people in a level of poverty, make them think that that's all they need to get by on. This is the amount you can get by on. And I was like thinking, wait, um, because I was earlier, I was talking about caste systems and I started thinking, wait, 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 we could have an a amount of people unemployed, $30,000 extra going on, where we still tax them, we still take their tax money, we still take whatever the tax amount is for, you know, payee, whatever it is, because everybody gets taxed, no matter what you're on, everybody get taxed, you can be on the benefit, you can be on the, um, what I'm on, which is a sickness benefit, um, because my screwed up body due to a um, car accident, but also you can um, be born with an issue and which, you know, you, you know, you're handicapped or you're unabled or disabled body, whatever the people want to use the word there. Uh, you kind of are living on a l low income of um, money right? You're having a very small amount of money and, you, and you're and you focusing on making sure that's all that you're within, within your budget for that small amount. So if you're getting $270 a week, you are desperately making sure you can get there. Now, I know of situations where 
People have done nasty things and gone out of the way to make their money. All right. So they would go out and sell drugs. They'll go out and sell themselves. They would go out and steal because that extra money. And but here's the thing. But nanny state can still give you that money at the every week and you, you can live on that money or you can do something about it. Right. You can um, educate yourself. We're so, you know, everybody's like I was saying on there. Everybody's got a cell phone. Um, you can learn a new language. You can learn a new um, art. You can learn a new way to write. Um, you know, learn how to be a storyteller. Do your podcast. Become a sensational YouTube influencer because nobody just becomes an influencer. Right. Nobody gets all this thing just by sitting there doing nothing. Uh, you can be a game designer. You can be a comic book artist. There's so many tools. You can have a free month of using a new tool and uh, you can use a little bit of money you're getting from that doll, that cast amount of little, you know, uh, text money, whatever. And you can slowly put a little percentage of that away to better educate yourself. So you're not living on that little doll money every week and you're stuck in that lifestyle of poverty. And it is a lifestyle of poverty. It's not, you know, uh, and it's it's a, it's supposed to be there to help us to get, you know, to go out and do something. And one of the guys mentioned from Rubicon the other night that there's a there's a um, zero fees for youth workers right now. They need a lot of youth workers because we know, in, especially here in Northland, there's you know we have an issue with suicide, right? And um, and there's a lot of youth that need help. And we can, if you want to, um, you know, if you love. Um, if you like youthful things, whatever, and if you want to help our youth, you can go get free education to actually be paid, right? To be able to get off that doll, to go and help someone. And the other great thing about it is when you actually help someone, your well-being, your mental state, your fullness of life is so much better, right? You feel so much more when you're giving and you forget about the little issues and the little issues you have come into line and you go wow he's actually worse off than i am and even though that seems like a negative thing but you it, you know it's a mental um you know sort of like a seesaw where it balances out slowly and you go you know i feel good about helping someone and now they'll feel good about being helped and they'll go and help someone else that whole uh you know circle of life if we if we work on that and i think it's um it's there's so much available to us and i just don't understand um, and I understand how hard it is to get into a system and stay in that system because it's easy after a while you get used to it. What do you think about that? It, it worries me that we are living in a society that is just uh, making it challenging from all different mm -hmm. dimensions. You know, uh, in some respects, you know, uh, the recent kind of events of kind of like the last, you know, four months or so, mm -hmm. I think have been really um, raising uh the good opportunity to have a chat about a whole bunch of things you know that we should be talking about the opportunities that ha that people have available that we should be talking about what's the impact of um uh, you know the things that we're importing from other countries and and what's the conditions that they're living in such that we get you know, the advantage uh, uh, of, you know, something costing, you know, $5 as opposed to $50 if it was made in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, this is where we've got a really great opportunity at the moment that, that given you know, given that the New Zealand economy relied a lot on money coming into the country um, from tourists. There's um, something I was going to talk about as well. 
tourism. Yep, go for it. And and we need to kind of go well whilst we're in this sort of situation where the government realizes that a lot of investment needs to be put into the country. Um, what? And on one level, I think um, I don't think you know if you just depoliticize the whole thing. Uh, I don't think it really matters, perhaps, which government was in power at the moment. I think we'd still end up seeing the same type of thing, whereby it's an investment to kind of keep us chugging along until we can get back to the thing that everyone was doing before, globally. Hmm. You know, this is kind of like a stopgap measure until we can go back to doing what we were doing before. Yeah. And uh, the reality is, is that what we were doing before, like what we were doing prior to, say, February, that was working for some people. Yeah. And it was not working for other people. Yeah. And the evidence seems to suggest that it was not working for most people. Mm. Like, not working across the board for most people in lots of different ways. Um, and, you know, this is where I think sometimes is that you, you've also got to kind of like give a, I'll tell you what, we, we might get to why this is it, perhaps an interesting thing to discuss later, but, you know, I think we need to listen to, you know, the poor rich person who's saying like, well, you know, normally, I, I would have been able to buy a brand new Porsche this year, yeah. right? Well, like, I know that for a lot of people is that, you know, they're not going to be heartbroken at all for that person. Yeah. But 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 then, you know, the person that was, uh, that was planning to buy a new TV set or a new computer yeah. or, or um, uh, a new bike, or something that they were going to buy because that was going to enable them to get some more training or more education or more opportunity. Like, you know, we we um we need to be very careful that um, we lived in a world before whereby um, everybody had some plan about you know, kind of what they were on about and what they were trying to get and what they were trying to achieve. The problem is, is that um, on a, on kind of like a, a sliding scale of some type, right, you know, we knew that where our world was going towards is that fewer and fewer people are getting more and more and more and more people are getting less and less. And... Uh, this is, um, you know, and this is where now with the stopgap measure that the government is making financially, yeah. we, we, we need to take this opportunity to have a discussion and to say, like, well, what if the global economy does not recover? What are we going to do then? Mm. Um, how are we going to afford our lifestyle yeah. um, if we don't have tourism? Um, how are we going to afford our lifestyle if um, people don't want to buy our products anymore? Maybe not because they even see. See, this is the bit that that you know is kind of like the other side of the coin, right? Is that we've created a global economy, yeah. so it's kind of like you know other countries are suffering too. They're they're going to be making decisions around where they spend their money. And, and, and maybe the problem that we might found, find ourselves in is that, you know, some of the stuff that New Zealand was exporting, um, and then you could include tourism in that as well, what yeah. we were exporting is that we we're exporting luxury goods. We we're a luxury yeah. goods exporter, you know, our mm -hmm. seafood, our timber, um, our, our art, our, our meat, um, like we were exporting luxury goods. And let me and um, let me read you something that came across, right? That was shared from a friend of mine who I actually went to school with. There was 
that somebody else said and this is from um and it's from a post on facebook and it says sorry i got to to say this here goes regarding the tourist industry they come to us cap in hand now wanting our support they want us to travel and visit new zealand tourist sites what a pity they spent the last 20 years selling overpriced attractions to foreigners hobbiton at 89 dollars te pua springs uh 79 uh, 76 dollars rainbow springs 80 dollars white tomo caves 64 dollars signs and souvenirs priced and signed in foreign currency language domestic airfares dearer than flying to australia i've had that it was horrible coming from south island to new zealand i'm um, to auckland was the same as going to australia and i had to come visit my family right so um domestic affairs dearer than flying to australia train fares dearer than just about anywhere in the world motels at twice the price for comparable ones in the uk and as for the fallacy that new zealand owns its tourism industry a quick walk through the duty-free section at auckland airport should set you straight on this nope it's too expensive you have ignored the local tourists for years now sorry unless you give me a deal e.g. permanent big discounted New Zealand residents, you won't be seeing me. Regarding the call from local suppliers to buy local, I bought a can of tomatoes yesterday from Pack and Save. 69 cents imported from Italy, 99 cents. That's about the same price I paid the other day for my tomatoes because I love my tomatoes, uh, especially my canned tomatoes. Always got to have them for pasta, right? Or whatever else. And especially with Indian food, it's nice to have that in there. So 69 cents for Pack and Save for Tomatoes, a can of tomatoes imported from Italy. Kiwi ones, $2.10. Treat us fair as a fa fairly producers, and maybe you will get our support. New Zealand mutton is cheaper in the UK than here. New Zealand timber is cheaper than uh, in Australia than here. New Zealand wine is cheaper in the UK. $4 for an advocate from uh, Kati Kati. $4 for uh, co um, cauliflower grown in Pukekohe is ridiculous. For so long, we have been gorged here in New Zealand by our own suppliers that we have grown to accept it. Now that the all-important ex export market has dried up, guess what? All of a sudden, we are indispensable and called on for help. Sorry, but I'm still going to purchase whatever is the best value. And that comes to, you know, because you've got to make that money work. They've got to make the dollar work. Um, if local producers want my support, be competitive and stop chasing that all important export dollar at my expense just saying and um yeah i saw that come across me because a friend of mine shared that from another person you know it was a photo a photoshop uh not photoshop sorry screenshot shared and i'm thinking he's perfectly right we want uh, you know we want to be able to um, put food on the table we're not going to buy the expensive local product we're just going to buy the cheap thing that's here but then we remember you know earlier on we're talking about that old almighty Carbon tax, carbon footprints. So this is tomatoes coming all the way from Australia, but I'm um, Italy, but you know we can't get it from Kati Kati, you know, or from down the block, for you know, and this is where I think uh, I guess the markets, right, the farmers' markets for us is very important, but even that sometimes is overpriced as well, and and the whole whole idea of organic food. Right, only the rich people mostly can afford that to be eating healthy organic food, and and people are saying, well, you got to eat healthy, you got to eat healthy, but then you're overpricing products for ourselves, and you know, um, the, my comment was like, yeah, pork from America is cheaper than pork from New Zealand, right? So it's got to come all the way, and they're talking about us paying carbon tax all year round, and Australia, um. um China and India, the biggest plotters because of what we've just talked about earlier, because of New Zealand Rail and you know the stuff like Bhopal, because of pollutions and all that, they don't really get in buy into the carbon tax. And yet we who are actually trying to stay green and clean have to pay carbon tax dollars. For, and that's actually not helping our economy by having to actually push that money onto ourselves, right? Because if somebody's got to pay that tax. It's the producers. It's a guy on the driving his his um, truck, carrying it from A to B, and you know wherever else across New Zealand, trying to get produce to the markets, produce to the factories, uh, uh, to the stores, and all that. Everybody's carrying that, and our tax dollars keep getting you know our tax 
uh, rate keeps getting higher. And this is another thing that somebody said to on, on the street today was, um, you know, who's gonna, you know, who's gonna pay for these, um, you know, these, um, all this money they're handing out? The tax guy. And who's gonna, who's gonna pay the tax? We are. Right, the tax guy's going to come and claim our taxes. So is our and this is what somebody else said, not me. She said, "Well, they're going to raise our taxes, aren't they?" What do you think? Is that what's going to happen? Are they going to start raising our taxes? And then we'll get back into the whole food thing in a minute. Hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, that's the other side of this is um you know whilst we are um being assisted with um, an economic stimulus package a package that would have come out regardless of which which government um yeah might have debated how much and they might have debated who got what yeah. um uh uh But at the end of the day, is that it's a debt that's that that country's going into. Yeah, somebody's got to carry and pay it in the end, right? Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, this is where the system of the world that we live in now mm. is very, very complicated. And 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 actually, you know, um, uh, and and this is this is where. This is where, um, whilst I, I totally so, so what I want to do is I, I, I think actually this question and the statement around you know the, the problems of um, importation of goods, the cost of local goods, the cost at a you know amusement park and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, and, and then you get into issues of like foreign ownership as well. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, like if you said getting into Rainbow's End, you know, or say like 50 bucks for locals, mm. 90 bucks for overseas people, but all the profits go to a foreign owned entity that owns Rainbow's End, yeah. like, you know, and, um, and you know, I, I love the example of the um, the tomatoes because because we were just talking about that recently, and 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 I've been debating this one for for a while, um, uh, and you know, like it's always very tempting to pick the can off the shelf, particularly if your issue was about price. Um, if your issue is about price, then I totally understand why you pick up the can of 69 cents of tomatoes that are imported versus um, the, um, you know, the $2, $3, you know, organic local canned tomatoes. Uh and you know these are the sorts of the discussions that we should be having, right? But the problem is, is that people launch into these debates um, in this kind of polarized way of saying, "Well, you know, we we shouldn't be bringing goods in from Italy, you know, traveling all across the ocean." Like, how do you seriously, like seriously, like even just at its most basic level? How on earth do you does anyone possibly think that it's possible to sell? And and what I when I say is this possible? I mean like this is true. Like you, you mm. I, I wouldn't have said sixty nine cents, but I know that they're pretty maybe on special, maybe at the mm. moment. Oh, I've been able to buy ninety nine cents, right? But, but, yeah, but I know that you can get them for like ninety nine cents and eighty nine cents regularly on special. How do you can tomatoes ship them halfway across the world so you're paying for all the, so so let's just think about the supply chain right it got onto the shelf on the supermarket someone no no wait 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 
Wait, but they got from the got from the ground, like from that farm. Yeah, well, I was going backwards. Yeah, go forwards from the ground, right? Yeah, it goes from the it goes from the um, the farmer. He washes it all up, right? Yep. He's got to spend all that water and stuff. Clean, and after it's actually been growing, now he's got to put on a truck, and then it's got to you know get, go to the factory. They got yep. to pick out all the bad ones, put it aside, choose all the right ones. Can it all up? Go through the process of whatever they do, the peeling, the blanching, and all that. Being a yep. cook, I know how that works. The can, and then can it, and then they got to put the old package around it. Then they got to put in cartons. Then somebody's got to come and pick it up and take it to the port. Put it on. Somebody else has got to put it on the ship, and now it's in. Um, and pallets and it's in the containers is getting shipped across from and sometimes it might go to different places along the way before it gets to yeah. us right yeah and it's kind of like how is that even possible how is it possible to land a can of tomatoes for a dollar on yeah. a market shelf like you know, and this, the, and and so like this is where you know, and we've had these discussions before, and and what uh, this is why I love us having these discussions is to say, you know, these are the types of examples where we need to be saying, there's something not quite right yeah. about that, right, and and it is actually good. It's actually good when I think it actually is good when you know you can compare the $3 can of organic tomatoes versus the 69 ones yeah. because um, it's not to say that one is right and one is wrong. It's yeah. actually just to say, like, that's a really interesting thing. Like, why is, you know, this can $3 and why is the other one 69 cents? And I think that would be a really useful, you know, kind of discussion, you know, for us to have because I think it talks to all of the issues that we've been talking about. You know, yeah. and, and part of the reason is is because um, the reason why it can get landed here so quickly, and don't forget, this is not a charity. No. People are making huge profits yep. along all of that path. So somehow that 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 69 cents is is a profit to someone, somehow. Um and 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 a lot of what it is is that um, you know, somebody else's government is subsidizing it. Yeah. Like that that can probably costs, you know, at a conservative estimate, um, it probably costs $69. Yeah. Now, this is actually the problem. This is actually the problem. That actually the can of tomatoes that you bought for 69 cents actually costs $69. It's just that the the difference. So basically, sixty-eight dollars um, yeah. uh, is 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 actually like debt is being created, future debt is being created. So by buying the sixty-nine cent can of tomatoes, what you're actually doing is that there's this all this other cost that's yeah. actually been created, but it's being but the debt for that is being is being like pushed out into um, the future. Um, and and the reason why I say that is that, for example, the 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 pollution from the mining that produced the the raw materials for the can, or yeah. the um, uh, the 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 shipping of it over here and the pollution that that's causing the manufacturing plant, um, the water that was that was drawn. So so imagine you know like uh, I'm just trying to think. There was a, recently a like there's many examples of this where whereby you know um, Australia has got terrible, terrible. I understand that New Zealand's got similar types of issues, but maybe not as bad. But in Australia, like there's terrible things whereby like you know um, uh, there's like water restrictions, but then um, uh, water licenses. Uh, are going so the water is going to do things like mining it's going to um big you know factory farming and then they're exporting and so then 
local towns in Australia are in drought, mm. it's not because they don't have water. It's because the water is being spent to produce a thing that's then being sold, you know, overseas. Yeah. Um, and likewise, like we're importing things whereby we think that's great. We, we've got this thing from this other country and it's really cheap. Um, but but the water that was that was um, used to grow those tomatoes um, is actually causing somebody else to go hungry mm. because the water well, is... Um, we're talking about water. Um, Fiji water is one of the most world-renowned waters in the world. A few years back, uh, before uh, the new government took over, there was, a, there was a person there who was getting um, under the table benefits of selling Fiji water very cheaply to America. And uh, like a liter would sell for about 12 as American. Yet the money that was going into the, into, you know, into the economy from that was something like about a dollar, even less than that. So... In steps uh, the new prime minister and goes, I think there's something corrupt going on here. Why isn't there enough more money coming into the economy because of this? Why are you sitting here, you know, getting paid a lot of money by a foreign government or foreign, not government, sorry, foreign uh, di producers, whatever, whoever was, was buying the water from them, you know, to make money off overseas. And you're getting the hand, you know, under the table um, deals, and yet the economy and uh, the, the the income from that water isn't going back into the economy. He kicked them out, right? And people go on about how how, how heavy handed he is, but this is corruption, you know. People don't think about corruption in this way, and you and you know we're talking about this um, pushing pushing debt into the future, right? So I remember, like we talk about studying and stuff. Like um, we carry as a you know as a student our debt, but that is someone has actually paid for that debt. You know, um, lo uh, our uh, our taxpayers pay pay that off, but we're going we're hoping to pay that back later. You know, and trying to pay that off, and some of us probably never will. You know, we'll die with that debt on our head that somebody else has paid for us. And uh, even there's um, I was looking into it a while back. You know, probably about 20 years ago, where where they were just basically, if you died with it, they write it off. But that's somebody's already. It's not written off. Somebody else has paid it off. You know. So, um, well, actually, just on that, like, you know, let's let's kind of like just talk about that because we have touched on this before um, in another conversation, and we talked about like, you know, businesses that, you know, we had we ended up with kind of three types of businesses out of the back of lockdown. Hmm. Businesses that were really good businesses and strong businesses, and so they were able to, um, with or without some assistance, um, able to like just lie low and then get back going again. Um, other businesses are good businesses, but they they're really struggling or, or they're going to need a lot of help. And then of course there's the other businesses which are basically let, let's just call it like they're just shitty businesses they were not what they were either it's like either a shitty business idea or um not a very well run business um and like you know why should they deserve help like that's a, a, an interesting kind of question mm. but and and so it, at the moment right here's just kind of like a rough figure you know like u.s national debt is 24 trillion dollars Right, twenty-four trillion dollars. Now, 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 the the argument kind of goes is that now now one of the reasons why a lot of businesses in Corona, uh, you know, out of the coronavirus that ended up really struggling, and think about the ones that needed like almost instantaneous government assistance. Yeah, the airlines, for example. Right, look at airlines. Right now. Why now? Now we talk about like cheap flights, right? Mm. And the thing is that the reason why the airline business around the world almost universally 
needed to be bailed out by governments almost instantaneously, and a number of them have already gone bust because the governments had to choose which ones they were going to save and which ones weren't, was because they were literally living from month to month. Yep. They were living from month to month on... So, so they're carrying, like, billions of dollars of debt mm. with interest, but it's just as long as they keep operating... Yeah. They that you know they they kind of managed to just barely break even, right? Mm. With the money coming in and the money going out. And in a way, like you know, this is how m most countries are now in this situation, whereby it's kind of like, you know, it's all very well to have a, a huge rack up a huge debt, but it's kind of like, um, you know, that's okay as long as you can just continue to just. You know, pay going off. Going on, yeah. Just I mean, going. We, we saw this with the with the comic book industry. It fell apart in two weeks. Two weeks. It basically um, they had a monopoly with a supplier, which based uh, called Diamond, and within two weeks they were like, "We're not doing it anymore. We can't keep moving comics. We can't keep doing." Uh, in America, it was like, uh, "We can't. Um, we won't be able to supply stores." Uh, we're not going to pay you, right? We're not going to pay you, uh, the producer, um, and the shops are going to be closed, uh, so you can't keep buying, and they stopped producing. And, you know, um, um, uh, DC and Marvel basically said to the workers, pencils down. No, we're not going to pay you while we're in lockdown. And, uh, and everybody just said, this is the biggest, you know, company's, that we know in the world wide. I mean, everybody's heard of Marvel and DC. They couldn't survive in two weeks. And here's these are these are like multinational companies. I mean, Marvel's owned by Disney. Uh, DC's owned by um, AT and T, Warner Brothers, right? Part of the big, huge conglomerate. Yet um, they weren't able to pay their little simple workers on, to carry on doing art and doing writing and stuff. And and it's you know it's kind of like they collapse within um, two weeks. I mean, um, you know, the airline business. I mean, they could have so many people traveling all the time if the prices were cheaper, right? As the guy said, you know, if if you if we if it was cheaper for us to travel and you know go down to South Island, I would love to go down and meet my friends in South Island and New Plymouth. If it was like fifty bucks a ticket, right? I could just jump on and I'll go to New Plymouth and spend probably a couple hundred dollars there. And then for that, and that money would go into economy. But no, it's going to cost but us here's three. Here's the, the example, right? Is that, you know, um, and this is the perfect example. Um, now, those, those cheap airfares hmm. um, uh, are now becoming part of national debt. Right. Because we're having to carry that payment for them, right? What happened was that in a, in a, in a, in a time where the airlines were competing, comp particularly across um, uh, the routes to New Zealand and, and um, via America and via um, Australia, like airfares got like ridiculously cheap. Like you could go to um, from, from New Zealand to Los Angeles or San Francisco um, you know, for as low as like eight hundred dollars return, New Zealand, right. right, right, right. Now, now, how can you do that? Well, you can't. But but what you're doing is that you what you're deferring because because the airfare is probably realistically something like five thousand dollars there and back, right? But but the other twenty two hundred dollars, uh, sorry. Uh, but well, let's just say simple, because it's kind of like you know there, there's some, there is some math around this, but it's just to illustrate the the problem, right? So um, let's just make an obtuse example. Like maybe realistically, the cost to go to fly to um, Los Angeles and San Francisco from Auckland probably is eight thousand dollars there and back. It's just Pretty that the yellow charge. It's just that the airlines charge eight hundred, because what they're doing is that the the costs get converted and pushed out to other people, 
and pushed into the future. Right. So um, uh, this is where airlines have um, uh, a lot of the cheap, cheap airlines. Um, they use um, uh, lower cost um, people from overseas. Mm. Um, and so Air New Zealand was competing with lots of these other overseas airlines yeah. and trying to do the right thing, but having to competitively, like, you know, like if 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 you can fly on 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 um, American Airlines for eight hundred dollars, and Air New Zealand will charge you twenty two hundred dollars. Who are you going to fly? With, right. Exactly. Is that now? It came up tomorrow but, again, isn't it? But I'll tell you exactly who pays for it. We're paying for it now because Air New Zealand had to be bailed out. Yeah. Right. Um, and so now we're 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 paying for the fact that Air New Zealand had to compete against these other overseas airlines um, in order to to stay competitive and stay afloat and 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 you know but he, but here's the question right it's a, it's kind of like well you know of course we want our own national airline um, and and every country at the moment is actually having to go through this exact same question of saying which airlines are they going to save and which ones are they going to let go but no one wants to not have a national carrier um i don't know how um fiji um airlines is doing have you heard heard how that some of the very specific uh, i think if i remember right they're, being, they're getting bailed i think um they're Because they're a small uh, airline, unlike New Zealand, I think they'll, I mean, obviously they won't need as much money, you know, but I think um, I might have to look into that. Uh, I know that um, there was stimulus going into tourism in Fiji. Um, the the uh, finance minister was talking about it and the tourism minister was talking about it the other day on, um, on YouTube. But, um, you know, how does a country like Fiji, right, you know, they, these are sort of the sorts of stories that, you know, I think we should be hearing more about because, you know, if New Zealand's a small country, but, you know, New Zealand is a very rich nation, really, um, both from a financially, like compared to our Pacific Island neighbours, right, New Zealand is a very wealthy country, but it's also very wealthy because it's got... A huge advantage as far as having a very large geographic region we've got lots of different resources we can grow lots of different things at different times of the year across the country um you know a lot of our pacific neighbors right you know all they need now is for one cyclone um to happen this summer it happens all right? the time and every this, year yeah, yeah but but just imagine if if this year because of climate change they have a particularly bad cyclone season. Like yeah. they're gone. Like they're screwed. You know, like they don't. They, they've got, like, and and they've got very small economies that rely on things like tourism, um, shipping water to Americans. Like I remember being in the US and seeing ads on TV or in papers for Fiji water. I, there is a very interesting um article that's actually been written about the whole fiji water thing right yeah. and it's terrible because like you know like if you think about it right um having to sell your country's water um it might sound that it might sound easy but like we already know in new zealand that we we are having water sources here Bottled up. Was, it, was it Nelson or Christchurch? I, I I I can't quite recall. And in fact, there's multiple locations where there's there's foreign on. Like here's like actually the best case I saw about this right was that there was a uh, uh, in Queensland. Um, there's very famous bottled water plant happening there, and um, the um, the local people were having to pay to have water trucked in to fill their tanks. Yeah. Meanwhile, down the road, there was there's a spring water bottling plant. Yeah. Right? 
And so th these types of things, it just it makes the mind boggle to say like, you know, but then, but then, you know, on some political divides and on the business side, they say, oh, well, we need to, but we need to be, we, we need to export. We need to export. I think it was yeah, 10 cents per yeah, leader. Right, I right. Said. They are right. Because yeah. the thing is that, you know, this is the kind of basic kind of wrong. I, these are totally wrong. These are totally wrong concepts, right? So anyone that's listening to this, right, this is how it works, but I really don't agree with it, and we've got to find a better way because because what we're saying here, right, is that this is not working. But basically, unless what you're exporting in value is equivalent to what you're importing, mm -hmm. at some point you're going to get into trouble. Because if you export too much and you don't import enough, then other countries will say, oh, well, that's unfair. Yeah. And, and if you, if you um, uh, uh, import a lot but you don't export enough, then you're not going to be able to afford it. And that's why local prices go, go up. This is why, like, you know, it, what one way of simply understanding this is that, that that's why, for example, like there's a disparity between, you know, like the US dollar and the Australian dollar there, uh, and New Zealand dollars. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of other things that go into that, um, you know, because it because it's a traded commodity. So you've got actually people gambling and betting on yeah. the being at at different differentials but at the end of the day is that you know what's the new zealand dollar at the moment compared to the us dollar right uh i think we're at about 65 cents. Cents. yeah 65 cents 65 yeah cents, right so what so effectively what that says right what that is literally saying is that new zealand is um it, it has has 35 cents less value than the USA. Right. When I saw this, because I mean, I mean, I personally deal with, um, you know, um, with an American company that, as everybody knows, what, if you're watching, you know, thing about Plunge, is that the convention is actually financed by a US, US company that I'm involved with called Rise and Comics. So, you know, the, when the money comes across, there is a uh, exchange rate that goes on top of that, and so you know, every, like you know, Jay mentioned that we, you know, we get our dollar right. They send us a dollar, and that dollar becomes dollar sixty five cents or so or whatever that is. And um, yeah. and I was talking to um, Jason today, my PA, and I was saying to him, "You get a dollar fifty. Uh, is it dollar thirty five or something like? That? What is it? Is it about that? Okay, so, so if if you get one US dollar, mm -hmm. you will get 1.5 New Zealand dollars. Right. right. There you go. So, so that's so why. So, so what was the rainbow end cost? Was it 80 90? cents. Oh, $80. A, a, 80, $80, right? $80, right? right? right. So, so, so that um, is 50 bucks for an American. Right. It's the same thing when I go to Fiji, right? Uh, and I haven't been for a while, but like, my dollar becomes dollar fifty Fiji, and uh, and the other thing is that those workers there sometimes get two dollars an hour, right? Some of the workers, depending on which work they're doing, it's around about two dollars an hour. And I uh, I got told off. I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier. I got told off because um, it felt to them. Some of them said, "Look, if you wave your, you know, I'm at a pub having a drink like a normal Kiwi would." I'm going to my normal pub and having a drink amount of that I normally would and not drinking more than I would. And But to me, it's normal. I buy, you know, a jug, I buy another jug and that's it. But the waiter comes up and goes, sir, um, look, I, I know you're not aware of the situation here. Yeah, I'm, I know you're not aware of the income levels because you're just having your thing with your mate, having a beer with your mate. Uh, but listen, don't be you, you, how you, how you actually normally doing your money. I've been to New Zealand. He said, I understand. 
but here because of how much these people earn it looks like you're flaunting your riches all right so my ten dollars is a rich man's money in fiji because i'm just you know i'm buying a jug of beer or whatever and it's it made me really think about it you know that that whole thing it's like value of money like now i don't i don't buy i buy i only buy stuff on special right on clearance or i buy secondhand stuff like today like i was saying to um, captain j before i was able to get this for three bucks right ability hardly ever used always brand new ability live right yeah, but uh, where did you get that from though i got that from the salvation army i know and that's the thing right is that how did they decide to sell it for three dollars but anyway um uh, but whilst you're talking about this right so so look you know my my numbers might be wrong here but just but i want you to carry on right yeah but this is just to give some context to what you were saying right about fiji mm -hmm. so currently um if someone from fiji comes here yeah they only get 70 cents new zealand right get hard end work for for them yeah. for them for them to get one new zealand dollar right. right so this is maybe why we don't get a lot of tourists from fiji unless they're yeah. rich right because you get family members this is a one thing you do get this family yeah, let, members let me just do the um let me just do the 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 sure. yeah, right, right? So for them to get one New Zealand dollar, they've got to spend a dollar forty Fijian, right? Now, here's the great thing: is that all of this stuff is quite fine. That you know, our dollar is less than somebody else's dollars, and da, 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 right. However, in Fiji, like the the minimum wage there is something like about two dollars an hour. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now, what's the minimum wage in so so what you're basically talking about is that is that for someone in fiji to afford say a ten dollar burger let's work yep. this out someone in fiji how many hours do they need to work but in order to so I, i'm just yeah. doing a rough calculation here they need to work one whole day mm. one whole day to buy a ten dollar burger in New Zealand because of tax, right? They got to pay that tax as well. Oh no! And yeah, well, actually, you're right because I didn't take into consideration tax. So, so actually, it and of course we're not even talking about them having a flight over here, yeah. right? We're just saying if they just somehow magically turned up, yeah, and said right, you know, Star Trek style, you know, you can we're gonna teleport you for free to new zealand you know right. for an hour you know what do you want to do i want to have a burger excellent burgers 10 bucks right um that would take them uh plus tax um it, that, that would that would be a day's days and a half work yeah yeah and and this is why um they you know the guy t said to me to you know don't be opening your wallet so often uh, you know and he said to me oh what i'll do is i'll set up an account for you at the front i'll get your tab once you're finished come and pay me put your wallet away keep it in your pocket don't put your wallet out every time i come over put it away and he said it's for your safety All right and not only that 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 you know you don't make them feel inadequate for their you know earning it's the same thing when you go to bali right when you go to uh, you know when you go to india you know wherever you go in the world uh where it's kind of like a third rate thing and this is why i get annoyed uh when people hound how things are in fiji and how people in the west talk about freedoms and rights and privilege and i think well do you actually have you actually ever been out of the country right have you actually been uh, in a place where they have no rights, they have no freedoms, where they're they're stuck in a caste system, or they're stuck in in a life of poverty, where the dead's just a, you know, all he knows is all farmer all his life. He's not he doesn't know about a computer, 
right? He doesn't know that you can do all these things on your computer. He doesn't understand. All he wants to do is get on with his life and think, and you're going to hound him because it's not, it's not organic food that he's growing, you know? That sort of kind of thing. Like, a really, yeah, I, I kind of think that a lot of people, if they could... But, but here's the thing, right? Is that, you know, in order for a country like Fiji to survive in the world, mm. um, they're going to have to export some stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the world that we kind of live in. But well, then, you know, the export, export stuff, right? But but Talking the exporting about, of stuff, um, you know, has local long term um, impacts. You know, and 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 how can you, you know, how can you sell your nation's resources at the expense of your own people? But you know, if they want, you know, a laptop, or if they want a big, you know, LCD TV screen, or if they want an airline or, you know, if they want a movie cinema or if they want to, you know, all of these, you know, the, the, and, and so here's, here's the other, you know, kind of interesting thing from this is that, you know, this is why the climate, this is why the climate problem is much, much bigger than what anyone or most people realise. Yeah. Is that, is that, um, about four billion people in the world right now don't consume as much energy as what you and I do. Yep. Right? Because they don't have the fridge or they don't have the air conditioner, the, the washing machine, the dryer, the um, the computer screen, the monitor, the sound system, the iron, the um, all of these things that we just take for granted yep. as far as modern appliances and our use of energy and so forth, um, is that um, if if all of those other billions of people live the same way that you and I do, um, like basically the only reason why the world is not on the brink of climate disaster right now is because four billion people are being suppressed yeah. in their living in their their ability to, to live the same way that we do. But if 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 tomorrow, let's say just say we could wave a wand and bring everyone up to kind of like some sort of like pretty average similar way of living, mm. this planet would collapse. Yeah. It would be game over. And so now we've got this kind of like really awkward thing of going like, hey, you know, climate change, you know, let's save the planet. But then you've got someone sitting in a part of the world that says, yeah, that's great. Um, but like now it's so hot now, I need an air conditioner. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. we're and, and oh, literally we're cool. going, yeah. no, yeah. you can't have an air conditioner. Because if you have an air conditioner and 4 billion other people have an air conditioner, like, yeah. w w w it, it will be even hotter. So we're, we're kind of like we're chasing our tails at the moment. It's yeah. hilarious, really. And that's why, that's why sort of I, 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 um, I kind of don't get into that because I think, like, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna say you, you can't have this, but then what about the people that need it? Like the like grandma needs to have an electric banker to keep her warm. She needs power yeah. in her house to keep her warm. Otherwise, she's going to freeze to death, and we're going to say, yeah. oh, grandma's dead. Now Now we've got to do this, and we've got to do this. And, yeah. and I, I think and sometimes... You're going to die from the heat. Yeah. On the other side. Hey, talking about exports and f back to Fiji, around about the 90s when the whole sugar is bad for you, it basically almost destroyed the economy of Fiji when the American... Uh, anti-sugar movement happened. Uh, Fiji used to be a great exporter of natural brown sugar, undiluted, not messed with pure from the cane, um, you know, just down the road, uh, you know, half an hour, an hour down the road from my house getting mixed up. We, our families to grow sugar and so on and would finance our, you know, our life, um, um, our home, our, um, you know, had been in there for 90 years. 
as far as I know, we're going more, right, of planting sugar and supplying the world with it for Fiji and supplying New Zealand, going to Chelsea, Chelsea's cleaning it up, either in brown sugar um, or white sugar, um, you know, refreshing or whatever they do with it, um, and exporting. And in the 90s, they decided, well, sugar's bad for you. Someone came out with a report saying sugar's bad, sugar's bad, sugar's bad. Nothing about if you limit, right, if you limit how much sugar you take, it's okay. So basically overnight virtually, right, um, if you take into account how quickly it happened, farms, gone. Sugar cane was never, one wasn't planted again. Just gone. These are like, that they've been doing for 90 odd years, even longer than maybe 100 years. They've been supplying the world with sugar. Gone. And so what then you have happened? Poverty. And uh, through poverty also came coups, right? People got angry uh, because there wasn't enough money going around. And you realize that this could have been a factor in the fact that there was poverty. Now, you look at America, uh, they, they've been in like um, in lockdown, like us. And people, like something like that, uh, one of the guys said today, there's about 40 uh, interview that I did this morning with uh, with a black man from America. And I even hate saying that. I just, you know, uh, a gentleman from America, uh, you know, he talked about how there's 40 million unemployed. So at that point, you had 40 million people in the, locked up in their homes and hounded by their, uh, by their local government, local police to stay in or you would get fined or you get thing. Starving virtually on the, on the brink of starvation. And, um, and a lot of people don't really understand this, uh, why they got into the situation where they, they, there's been pr police brutality all around and all this. Uh, uh, there's about uh, 19 uh, white people have died last year compared to nine um, black men have died. Um, but that doesn't even come into it. The fact that they died, they died. Murder is murder, right? But the other thing is they were locked up. All these people were locked up for a month or more than a month, right? Now imagine not being able to feed your families for a month, harassed and stopped from going out for a walk, hounded uh, by the you know the governing body, hounded by um, the police. I call them a gang, gang in blue, whatever, because hey, everybody's got a color, right? <laughs> At the end of the day, that they wear as a uniform. So then they, this happens, and all that rage of that came and poured out. And I think that's one of the reasons we see this. And I think, and even people realize it now, that this hasn't got nothing to do with somebody being murdered uh, and that should be held accountable and everyone has done that. But I think the rage of being harassed for, for those months, you know, watching all these um, uh, crazy Hollywood types hound them about how, how they're like everybody else, where they're singing in their bathtub with the, with the piano, you know, we're just like you in lockdown and living in their mansion, not worry about where the food comes from. And this is what I thought about even when we were in this, like, where are these guys going to get food from when they're in lockdown? Where's the, like we're saying, like the economy stopped. And not only that, we talk about the airplanes, right? Within two weeks, they were done, dusted. You had um, uh, companies falling over, Burger King, done. So whenever that happens, it's like, well, now you have no money to pay for your thing. And, um, you know, for your food, for providing your, uh, you know, milk for your for your baby, medicine for your children, you're locked up. And I've been talking with people working for babies there in America, talking about how they had to wait to get, go see the doctor and stuff, and um, all this stuff because you uh, and your and elders are afraid to go to the doctor because it's them because they have the flu or they might be actually have it and they might end up dying. That sort of that all that plays these magical uh, crazy things that in your head because um, and, and constantly being nine to five seven days a week right or not even nine to five 24 hours a day the harassment you feel mentally um, of you know not knowing where your next um, uh, food is going to come from the next economy and I think this is what they're realizing now is that this is more than just somebody being murdered and publicized in this way uh, and I think everybody outside of that understand, I think that the rage from that, the rage from um, not knowing where your food's going to come from, not knowing where your uh, your um, work, 40 million people, that's 10 times New Zealand's, you know, New Zealand's um, population. And 
and um, and trying to see it from other people's point of views on this has been interesting because I mean I always take things with a grain of salt. I I, I um I, you know sitting in the middle you go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep, and okay, and but at the end of the day, um, uh, our brains can take so much stress until it breaks, you know, and yeah, our like emotions. You know, there was um, recent numbers that I saw, which was around how uh, in and around the time of coronavirus, about 60 million people in America were facing uh, their water being cut off or mm. had already had it cut off. 60 million people um uh and uh that's for a lot of different reasons but um it's not unlike i think we're going to be finding also in many other countries you know similar people's inability to start being able to pay for basic things but even before coronavirus like 60 million people were under threat of having their water, water cut off or already had it cut off and then, you know, the government plea is to say, wash your hands, wash your hands. Well, how, how are you going to do it when, you, when your water's been, been kind of cut off? Yeah. And yeah. actually what, what, one of the great, great things out of the coronavirus has been is that there, there were many local, um, there were many cities. So, you know, what, what many people may not realise is that the way that kind of services work in America is quite different from, say, mm -hmm. here like New Zealand or yeah. um, in uh, in other countries, but over there, you know, like the um, the the cities there are often responsible for you know the whole thing. You know, their their police, their fire department, their health, um, their water, all of the other sort of services. Mm. Um, and because of aging infrastructure and rising costs and so forth, is that a lot of um, a lot of cities in America were approached by different corporate organisations to say, "We will look after it for you." Yeah, and then they and then they turned that service into this profit-making vehicle, and then they yeah. started being tough about your bill. And if you can't pay your bill, then we'll just turn yeah. it off. Like, That's what worries me about New Zealand, right? Well, you know, well, you know, um, you know, the and and so this is where this is where I think, um, you know, this is a gr another great opportunity to like, you know, for us to take a good look at, you know, all of our basic services, and see how they're delivered, who they're delivered by, where are the profits going from it. Um, you know, we should look at all of our basic types of services, electricity, power, so, uh, sorry, internet, um, uh, telecommunications, um, uh, food supply. Um, we should be looking at all of these things and, and saying is that like what what level of, of ownership and and it's not just about ownership and it's not just about profits, but but how do we how do we make sure like, you know, one of the big problems with, um, you know, the lockdown was that, you know, it's great if you had Internet. And yep. we're able to afford for, um, you know, a computer for each of the school children in your family. But you know, like, I, I, I can only but just feel dread for a say a family of five, right, living outside of town without you know cable, you know, like. You know, um, but also uh, that family that can't afford a computer, yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. even that family that actually can't afford the computer, let alone having fiber. You got to have the. You got to have fiber. You got to have a computer for each of your kids, right? Like, um, now here, here's actually probably the okay. So here's a good story, maybe out of all of this, is that um, you know, the, 
So let's maybe think about, you know, what's the list of, of kind of almost like the, the new charter of basic human rights, you know, that we should be um, fighting for for our, our people and families in New Zealand. And, you know, like I'm sick and tired of all of these arguments of saying is that like, oh, well, you know, you know, if you've got five kids, you know, you should be expected to do, 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 right? But this is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about, you know, how do we, how do we, look after our future, right? You know, this is like moving it away from like how this, you know, we, we, we've got to move the conversation outside of like what is your, my tax bill versus your tax bill and how much do you earn and what do you earn? It's like, you know, like let's be honest, right? We're all going to die, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, and fortunately, you know, um, and I know that some people will argue about this, but you know, fortunately, um, you know, I think um, you know a lot less a lot less of us are dead now um, the, because of the lockdown. And and one of the interesting things about the lockdown is that if you even just like put totally aside, you know, the whole question of you know whether it was a pandemic or not. Um, uh, in New Zealand, at least, um, and and look, I'm happy to be challenged on the numbers of this, but anecdotally, it appears, and I'm pretty confident, pretty confident that we could justify the statement, which is yep. that not only did not many people die because of coronavirus, yeah, is that a lot of people didn't die because of a whole bunch of other things. I've been absolutely horrified lately in the news of the number of people in New Zealand that are dying on the roads, that are dying yeah, I saw the accidents. From, from, from murders, yeah. dying from accidents. Duh, right. Like people, you know, people, you know, you remember how, you know, the thing that everyone kind of got, you know, a lot of people got kind of like really angry about kind of like, well, you know, like, you know, why can't we go for a surf at the beach? And it's kind of like, yeah. have you seen the number of water deaths? You know, yep. since then. And, and of course, you know, everyone goes, oh, well, you know, I wouldn't be that person. That's kind of like, I know, I know. But but it's someone, you know. It's always someone that dies on the road. It's always someone that dies through an accident. It's always someone that, that drowns. It's like it's always somebody else. And I think this is actually part of our problem is that, you know, one of the things that maybe we, you know, perhaps got from the lockdown was that, when we work together and if we work collaboratively, mm. um, we can actually achieve a lot. Um, and a lot of a lot of people are literally, like probably hundreds if not thousands of people are alive today in New Zealand because we went into lockdown. And, yeah, and, because we and, didn't have accidents, didn't have drownings and all that stuff, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at this like I um I um I went to look for the New Zealand Rail thing on stuff and I couldn't find it. Um, apart from the little one they had on the Herald, so they're talking about uh you know swimmers tries to um swimmer tries to tow boat. A man in his undies tried to tow a boat with his two mates still inside after it ran out of water. I uh, ran out of petrol, right? Uh, one person is was killed uh, following a car crash involving a car and a truck near Tutera in Napier. You know and. Uh, what was it five men five times over limit twice and you know uh what was it um where else uh there was um you know like you said there was a murder uh i think there was some sort of rape and stuff like that and i i i've seen so much more police activity since uh we went to level two have you noticed that oh well you know like where we live um almost as soon as we went from level four to level three mm. within about a day the number of sirens because we live in this you know sort of part of the city where it's kind of like we're, we're up on the hill and so we can you yes, know you we can hear the sound coming up there. we're similar as well i think yeah where we are yeah yeah, and so you you because we're in that basin, right? We're, when you're living on the edge of the basin, as we are, but on different parts of that basin, um, the sounds of the town echo, and the number of sirens. Like, um, it would be um, absolutely fascinating, like fascinating, 
Yeah. And so I have like no doubt. a couple of hours. Like have I have no doubt that yeah. if, if you were able to actually access um, like official numbers quite quickly, because a lot of this data takes time, but if yeah. you were able to get like official numbers, I am absolutely conf like 100% confident that we would see some really, really interesting stats. We, we yeah. at, like compared to lockdown and we're, What's great about this? What's great about the lockdown? So whether whether you, so here's here's an interesting thing. Whether you agree with lockdown or not, here's the great thing. We now have a data point. Yeah. About almost everything. Yeah. Who how does people behave? How much? Um, how much uh, money we need to spend? Uh, yep. How much food needs to be in, out there? At that particular time, how much uh, toilet paper, right? How much resources we need to give to our, our hospitals? How much we need to spend on our education for our teachers? Our, uh, making sure how much money we have to make sure is spent on fiber to make sure that every house is supplied. Um, how much money we need to make sure that uh, household income is, depending on how many people are there uh, for food, for power, and so on. And like we talk about, like with computers, how many students would need to have computers at one time? If there's five people yeah. in the house, give Another them three people right? computers. Yeah. It's that, you know, like we're heading towards an election. Yeah. This is going to be interesting. And, and I actually think maybe what, what we should do, like we're in June. We're in June, right? So when's the election? Um, oh, isn't it November or something? September. Yeah. September. So I, I'm actually thinking like maybe you I and I... Yeah, after well, you said it last like, time, I, I put the word out and said, hey, who's interested in coming on board and discussing us? Nobody's yeah, really come up back with it. Is, um, you know, offline we'll discuss this, but m maybe it would be great now, you know, with the timing is that maybe every two weeks we now, on a fixed day every week, mm. um, I, I think we maybe do it every fortnight, I think yeah. is the right sort of cycle, um, is that we have like an election sp special an election what? discussion um, because as we get closer to the election, um, uh, it's going to be really interesting, like, because um, there's a lot to talk about um, as yep. far as the New Zealand um, uh, election. And uh, there's... Um, a lot of other groups that are kind of talking, um, kind of about this, um, and it's uh, and and I kind of the reason why I raise this is because I, I kind of wonder in the back of my mind whether, you know, what does the government do in its last term, right? All right. So so just li like literally, you're 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 looking at a government at the moment that is like three months away from an election. Right? If I was in government, I'll be buying favours from the people, right? And hit, and I'd be going, well, this I'm going to bribe you, bribe you, bribe you so that you can keep us in government. And that's just my, my evil brain thinking. You know, well, the, definitely they do, it's definitely um, Australian politics, mm. right? That's how Australian politics work. It is it is basically a bribe system. Mm. Um, I I think that we need to kind of do what we can to try and eradicate any kind of yeah. You know, like, but it, it makes sense for Australia, right? You know, like Australia is a penal colony, right? <laughs> you know, like, you know, it, it's it's like, you know, a bunch of criminals sent another bunch of criminals right. to, to commit criminal activity against yep. a bunch of people that had been living there for 100,000 years. Right. right? So, so Australia's starting point you know, is not a great yeah. thing, you know. You know, so it's one bunch of criminals with a bunch, another bunch of criminals um, mm. basically making profits from stealing land, right? Um, and, but, but that is exactly what works in Australia. 
you know. I think for um, I, gift. I think for us here, um, I noticed a bit of that uh, bribery going on when um, Helen Clark was talking about legalizing marijuana. Now, I'm not for legalizing marijuana. I'm for decriminalizing it. And um, I want the criminalization of it off, right? Because Ooh, I know should, that... Um, we, should a, we should do a cannabis special. We could. You know, uh, I'm sure there's some green or some other party member that will be interested in doing that. But I think that was a bit of a bribery. I, I felt that here... Because I, when I saw the stick, right, about the police, and then I saw Helen Clark talking about this and other politicians talking about we should look at legalizing marijuana and i'm thinking yeah that's because you're going to tax the hell out of it aren't you right but the other thing is that's also because you want to keep us dumb you don't want us to educate ourselves you don't want us to think about you know uh what's going on in our politics what's going on what are you doing behind the scenes where's our debt going yeah, and all yeah, this right. stuff to be fair yeah. right and and i agree like it, i think you could throw you know the massive tax argument at it um but you know you're allowed to, to like under the proposed legislation right you you're allowed to grow your own plants right just not sell now, it isn't it hmm? is it and but you're not allowed to sell it it's for yeah it's for personal use right yeah. and um and like uh but you know this is isn't this the argument right like but like as you mentioned before, someone was was you know talking about the cost of buying a cauliflower, right? right. Well, I say what is that? You know, the cost of cauliflower if you grow it in your own garden is is quite low. Um, mm. uh, but actually, there's a hidden cost, and and growing the cauliflower, um, growing like it actually costs me. Um, like, if if I'm to grow a cauliflower, it probably cost me about twenty bucks. Yeah, I've right? had that trying to do something. Well, my, I can my buy them for two dollars, you know. And yeah. so, you know, if you're prepared to, you know, you know, grow your own and to do it on the cheap, mm. then you can. But it's kind of. Like, but anyway, let's. I, I, you know, everything I've seen so far about, you know, what the proposed legislation is, um, the the really interesting um, one, um, there was a really great interview on RNZ on Saturday, and I'm prepared to, you know, find the link. Um, mm, but she was it. talking to a uh, doctor, a researcher around, um, you know, because, like, you know, the people have got lots of genuine concerns about the impact on of, of cannabis uh, yeah. on public health um and and i think you know like that's a sensible discussion like it's kind of like okay let's not talk about cannabis now but let's yeah but let's counterpoint this discussion right is that let's go back to where we started right we want to have a national referendum and almost a really you know dirty fight around whether cannabis is legal decriminalized or illegal yeah but yet we have no debate no referendum about billions of dollars of money leaving this country right. that we're going into debt for yeah and it's like these are the types of contradictions which I think are the things that we need to, and these discussions that we have, like, really start to zero in on, is that wh why is it that it's a it's a knockdown fight around cannabis or no cannabis, but we're more than happy to, to spend billions of dollars overseas for things that there's no national accountability debate, referendum or discussion around you know so imagine if we we had a national referendum about overseas spend yeah right? maybe we should have a referendum about that you know how much how much of investment you know should go to um um, um outside of new zealand w what's the right you know, maybe we should have a national room. And, and and so for anyone that says, you know, we, we shouldn't, you know, allow cannabis, I would say, well, let's have a, 
referendum about wealth. Right. Right. And let's have a referendum about, you know, how much money leaks out of New Zealand, right? Mm -hmm. that, that all of our collective, you know, wealth, you know, that we create in this country, you know, all of our natural resources, all of our natural, you know, maybe we should have a referendum around wh whether we should allow exports of water. Yeah, because right? um, when it's all, that always worries me when uh, that, you know, it's like, shall we export our air one day, you know? Right. So where you know, and uh, that's not that's not a stupid statement, right? Yeah. Like that is a very and like shh, like don't sell the air. Well, it's right? done it. Somebody's doing it. I, I, I saw some places where they actually have canisters of air, pure air, where you can go and you know suck that up. And I'm like, and, and well, I know that there's already a there's a really controversial business already already on New Zealand. I'm just going to quickly look it up, but there's already a very controversial um, business um, called um, NZ on air. Yeah. And, and, and my, my understanding is that it's actually, it's, it's funded by the taxpayer. It's called New Zealand. Like on air. <laughs> yeah. I think they do radio stations, yeah. TV and all sorts of things, but New Zealand on air. Um, but you know what we don't want to have is you know um, actually I'm just going to do a crazy Google search. Exporting. I'm going to give you the last words because we're coming up to like there. two hours and we're going to close up at two hours. But I'm going to give, let you finish off on this one. No, no, but but you're right. Like you know, and and we should be careful. Like it sounds like that. Like what, once upon a time, someone would have said, you know, like we're going to export our water, like. And, yeah. and and when people had that discussion, right, it, it, no one would have really have gone kind of like, no, that's a really bad idea. But, like, how many years now are we in drought? Uh, Northland, right. we just had Northland drought, right? So, it was like so two, why, three months of it. So why are we exporting our water when we're a country in, in drought, right? Yeah, and we're getting so seasonal drought, which is kind of... You know, which is kind of interesting. We're getting seasonal drought, and like they were exporting water. I mean, they were uh, tankering, you know, uh, driving in water around all over Auckland. People having to say, "Well, you know, paying for all this water." Yeah. And you're right. I think um, this. You know, I think we we're not asking enough of our politicians what they're up to. And. Uh, I remember, uh, like, uh, I was, uh, you know, I've always been um, socially active, but never really, you know. I mean, being who I am, I, uh, you know, I've got my, I've got my uh, comic book and all that side. And even last year, when I before even when I was thinking about doing this last year, I was thinking, what if people don't, you know, go all crazy against me because they thought you're the comic book guy? Why are you doing this? You know, what is you, you know, why are you discussing all this stuff? Why getting all, all this political stuff? I've always been this way, you know, it's just that I haven't, um, I've, I've kept it more personal groupings, you know, talk to people around me more than being open about it. I mean, not, I mean, not open about it, but being, having the vo voice to do it. I mean, 20 years ago, I was talking about youth suicide on radio, all of Northland, and I was doing that again in 2018, but. It's not something I've. It's new to me, but I think the idea that we we just don't our politicians to task, we don't hold them to uh, accountability, and we just go let them go in for the next four years and do what they want, and the next four years somebody else gets in. Next four years, you know, if they're lucky, they can go in. Uh, <laughs> um, I will put that up there. Thank you, Lamel. Um, you know, and and the whole idea, of, you know, questioning these politicians enough every and why do we all we do it at election time right why don't we do it right throughout the years every four years they're in there why are we saying you know we need to know what's going on tell us what's what's that next new bill you're gonna up okay we're gonna talk about that now and i think a lot of time my uh my parent one of my parents was saying the other day um the other week that News is becoming opinionated 
and they're not actually asking the questions anymore of deep things. They're just giving them, like, I mean, we give opinions because we, this is what we do. We're not news reporters, we're not reporters. We discuss this stuff, so it's totally different. And my pop goes, you know, I hate seeing these guys on TV they have somebody like Jacinda Ardern up there, but they're giving their, their opinions about what she's doing. They're not asking, what are you doing? They're saying, I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong. Not saying, tell me what you're doing, then I'll, 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 I'll try to ask about that, whether that's right or wrong or not. But you're saying, you know, when it's everybody's busy right now, right? All the politicians are busy, but they just, you know, they have an opportunity to question them. They don't, they give them opinion right instead and i think um that is harmful to us as a as a nation to not get the answers we need when we go into election like you said to september right we're not that far away um what's that four months five months from the biggest thing that happens in new zealand every year but we it just becomes blasé about it right because it's just politicians and we just tick the boxes and we just let them do their thing without questioning so I'm going to let you have your um, have the last word. I don't want to have the last word on these things. Um, so we got minutes tonight, and I will not interrupt you. I've, I have a problem of interrupting people with their last words. Yeah. So I will. No, no. I apologize just before. So um, I I think we should start to uh, plan out an election special, right? And that we you know maybe start out slow. Um, but it's like a dedicated election special, you know, conversation like this. Um, and then we do more as it gets closer to the election. Um, I think we need to, uh, as part of that, like really, like really encourage young people to vote. Yeah. The lack of young people registering to on the electoral roll and so, so getting them to do that is one thing. Um, and then getting people to vote, right? I, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really kind of like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in what people might vote. People can vote, you know, for whatever party they, they want. But I would really love so many of our young people to be on the electoral roll so that they can vote. Secondly, that they do vote. And then thirdly, if we get the chance, you know, to in, inform them about the choices that they get to make. Um, and w one of the great things that I'm kind of like been thinking about and working on is that um, uh, our Australian uh, brothers and, and 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 sisters in some of their recent elections, they come up with some amazing kind of like just very simple kind of things whereby you could like compare different political parties and that mm -hmm. and that like on the key issues for um, young people um, uh, that you could kind of see what different political parties thought about the issues that are important to young people and to our people. Um, and so we can work on those types of things. I actually think that um, uh, if we actually get ourselves like a schedule going, I think that, you know, we could actually get some some members of different political parties that would actually be keen to join to us. And 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 what I think we should do is, is do kind of the, the sort of stuff that... Um, you know, I think great people like Joe Rogan have been doing, which is to give, like, yeah. you know, Joe Rogan was like one of the few left media personalities who gave people like Bernie Sanders, like the opportunity to like talk for like two hours. I can't remember yeah. how long they talked for, but like, you know, Joe Rogan's a great fan of Bernie Sanders. Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders is not no longer running now for mm. the Democrats party in america um well they ate themselves didn't they and this well, is a thing well, of them well you could almost um argue is that it's kind of like it's it's and so this is this is where you know we 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 need to take these issues to heart right like all of these things that we've been talking about are the sorts of things that bernie talks about which is about fairness and equity and 
history and the future and where we want to be and where we're at and like you know it's almost like in a way you know bernie i don't think you know that's why bernie never really wanted to be kind of like a democrat because it's kind of like well he never really wanted to because that's the thing about him you know there's no like you shouldn't need to define yourself left or right or political right. party if you want to be a humanist, you know. Mm. Um, and and maybe we could make that our challenge is that in this New Zealand election, yeah. maybe what we should do is to kind of like say, you know, it's kind of like we don't want to talk about left or right or this or that. What we want to do is that we want to find the humanists, you know. And, and if anything that I think that Jacinda has done, that's been successful is that, you know, Jacinda has uh, appealed to, you know, humans. And, right. um, you know, even in this country, with only 5 million humans to look after, gets pretty controversial at times. Um, so I look forward, look forward to, to us well, doing... we've got to figure out how to do it. That's the thing. It's so like whether these people are there allowed there to come on. Right? So we've got this great op opportunity over the next three months of all of these things that we've been talking about that we can put them in the spotlight and ask them the hard questions. Well, uh, with this, because I um, I opened, um, I actually started, paid for the system now. We can have six people on at the same time. No more logo up there or anything like that. It's all open to us to do this. And, uh, and it's live streamed. And it's, you know, I think um, that's the great thing about it. You can't, you can't on a live stream take back later as a politician. <laughs> all right. That's what I love about live stream is like, uh, I mean, I'm go, go, go. But I mean, I still, my thinking is always there and I've thought it through. So that's thank long. you guys. We've just gone over the two minutes with me putting in the sloth. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you guys again. And thank you, Jay. Uh, always a great time for us having a discussion. And I think uh, that's what I enjoy. It's like um, you don't know where this is going to go. We started with New Zealand Rail and fraud and stuff, and we went all the way around to Fiji and equity and finance. Uh, we went to food. We, uh, we went to tourism and if you you know if you're just jumping in you don't really realize what we're talking about uh because we move around so much with what we do and that's because of my brains like that and um it's non-linear and but we get you know we get a lot done and we're going to get a lot more done as you said going into the um, you know election and yeah uh, hopefully i mean i've put the word out hopefully people will go you know would like to come on but hey it's a great platform because um i know um there's nothing like uh, honesty on a screen, you know, live. And, uh, and that's what I loved about Joe Rogan. I haven't seen it for a while. And that's what, you know, I enjoy the fact that you can sit here and listen to someone get everything they're thinking out out. And, yeah, and I think um, yeah, you that learn was, a lot. Uh, Joe's, that was Joe's. Um, that was one of the things, and, and maybe we should post the link and share it with people. But that was one of the things that that Joe said was that it's kind of like he he kind of like he's like there's this moment where he sits back and he's kind of like, yeah. you know, this is one of the problems is that people are making political choices over like five seconds that they hear about. Yeah an issue and yep. uh, I think one of the th great things that lockdown has has embraced us with is more of the engagement to say sometimes these things just take a long time to discuss yeah and that's the best thing um, to stand on tonight um, thank you guys. Thank you, Kampu J. Once again, um, Kakitiano. Thank you for watching wherever you watched us from. Um, all the best. Hopefully, wherever you are, you're safe. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're watching us on Facebook, thank you so much. Um, and if you're watching us on uh, 
YouTube, like, subscribe, as I say. Uh, us here in New Zealand, we don't, we're not very much into self promotion, so it's up to you to do what you can do for us. And if you enjoy what we do, give it a like. And thank you for watching again. And we'll see you next time. Kakiteano once again. Farewell.